Astronomy, the study of celestial objects like stars, comets and galaxies is one of the oldest disciplines of science. From time immemorial, early civilizations of the Babylonians, the Greeks and the Indians are known to have made methodical observations of the sun and the night sky. And based on what they could see with their naked eyes, they speculated and theorized on the nature of the universe. Then, around 400 years ago, Galileo Galilei invented the telescope in Italy. This invention spurred astronomy to develop into an exacting discipline and revolutionized our perception of the universe and Earth's place in it. Yet, when we look at the sky, it seems to be serene and unchanging because we can see very little of what is taking place in the cosmos, even with a telescope. Astronomers perceived the universe to be fixed and tranquil until the arrival of a 19-year-old Subramanian Chandrasekhar at Cambridge in 1930. It is to him, a couple of decades later, that we can credit the uncovering of the true nature of our universe. Explosive, energetic, dynamic, ever-changing. India has had a long tradition of scientific inquiry. Legendary physicians, mathematicians, logicians, physicists, metallurgists and alchemists. Aryabhata, born 476 Common Era, was one of the first in a line of great mathematician astronomers born in this country. His major work, Aryabhatiya, is a compendium of hypotheses which have proved extremely accurate. For example, he pointed out that the Earth spins on its own axis, that the Moon moves around it and that they rotate around the Sun. He had explanations for day and night, lunar eclipse and solar eclipse too, and had even calculated the length of a year to be precisely 365 days. His works were translated extensively into Arabic and Greek a couple of centuries later. And it is this grand tradition of Indian scholarship that Subramaniam Chandrasekhar carried forward, unraveling the music of the spheres backed by the power of elegant mathematics. Subramaniam Chandrasekhar was an outstanding scientist of the 20th century. Of course, his book on black holes was probably the greatest intellectual achievement. I must say Chandrasekhar was my role model, my idol. Chandrasekhar was born at Lahore when India was still a colony of the British Empire. And science education on the whole left a lot to be desired. From childhood, Chandra showed a remarkable affinity for mathematics. But his father, C. Subramaniam Ayer, Deputy Auditor General Railways, pushed him to pursue physics instead. Influenced maybe by his own younger brother, Sir C. V. Raman's success in the field, and also for better prospects of getting a government job. Initially, the Ayer family children, Chandra, his younger brother Balakrishna, and sisters, were taught at home in Mylapur. Later, he joined the best school in Madras the Hindu high school at Triplican. Decades later, he visited the school with his wife Lalita, a couple of years after receiving the Nobel Prize. She was delighted to find his records stand testimony to his brilliance in mathematics even in those early years. 
and being declared eligible to pursue further studies. In the beginning, Chandra found formal education not very motivating. Only when he discovered that the curriculum included algebra and geometry did he get really excited. Every year, he would complete the science and mathematics syllabus during the summer vacation itself, even before the school reopened. Teachers were in awe of him and regarded him a prodigy. While at school, Chandra received a prize, the famous textbook, The Internal Constitution of the Stars, by the distinguished British astronomer, Arthur Eddington. This was Chandra's first introduction to astrophysics. In 1925, Chandra enrolled at the Presidency College Madras. Here, he studied physics, chemistry and mathematics, but also seems to have had an innate enthusiasm for English literature. Chandra found himself drawn to physics rather than chemistry. Inspired by Srinivas Ramanujan, he wanted to specialize in higher mathematics but had to enroll in the physics honors class in deference to his father's wishes, which he later acknowledged as having benefited him immensely. When the famous German physicist Arnold Sommerfeld visited the college, Chandra learned from him about the discoveries of Fermi and Dirac, of the new quantum statistics and its application to electron gas and metals by Sommerfeld himself. Inspired, young Chandra looked for a problem where he could apply the new statistics. After only a couple of months of research, Chandra arrived at an interesting result that he described in a paper entitled The Compton Scattering and the New Statistics. He sent this manuscript to Ralph Fowler in Cambridge, whose work he was familiar with. And soon, like his illustrious uncle C. V. Raman, Chandra had his paper published in the prestigious proceedings of the Royal Society of London, while still an undergraduate student. And he Fowler connection started. And the following year, when even before he completed his um, graduate degree, he, uh, he was awarded the Government of India scholarship to go abroad. And then obviously, Fowler became a CS advisor. In some sense, it bound him to astrophysics. It bound him to Fowler. Chandra is best known for his celebrated discovery of the Chandrasekhar limit, derived during his voyage on a steamship to England. Chandra was interested in the final states of collapsed stars as determined by electron degeneracy. He had already studied the works of Arthur Eddington and Ralph Fowler before beginning his calculations. Chandra's crucial insight into this problem was to realize the importance of relativistic effects. Once relativity was included, he was led to an astonishing result that a star more massive than a certain limit could not exist as a white dwarf at all. Chandrasekhar made several important contributions to astrophysics and applied mathematics. One of his major contributions is identified with white dwarf stars and is known as the Chandrasekhar limit. It tells us that a star cannot retain its equilibrium as a white dwarf unless its mass is less than a certain limiting mass which is approximately 1.44 times the solar mass. When Chandrasekhar arrived in Cambridge in the 1930s, uh, the uh, university was of course one of the real hotbeds of science. R. H. Fowler was here and it, of course he was the official advisor for Chandra and so he was in probably the best possible environment. Of course the groundwork for quantum mechanics had already been done uh, by uh, Schrodinger, Heisenberg etc and by Dirac and so Chandra was at the optimum age really because he uh, absorbed these ideas when he was young. The early part of the 20th century were exciting years in the history of Western science. A series of extraordinary theoretical breakthroughs had ushered in quantum mechanics 
and thrust a new modern scientific era upon the world. Cambridge was the mecca for scientists, a time of great vitality and confusion, a time of transition from classical to quantum physics. And young Chandra had his sights firmly focused on the distant firmament. Chandra attended lectures by Dirac, Fowler, Littlewood and other luminaries. With so many famous names and an array of fascinating subjects, operational calculus, functional theory, generalized dynamics, statistical mechanics, Chandra was almost dizzy with excitement. The next five years were perhaps the most brilliant phase of Chandra's long and illustrious career. He obtained several fundamental results which are now recognized to be at the base of modern astrophysics. The discovery of pulsars, burst of neutrinos from supernovas, and the fact that the measured masses of neutron stars are almost equal to 1.44 solar masses are spectacular confirmations of the predictions made by young Chandra in the 1930s. After pursuing quantum mechanics for a year in Europe, Chandra returned to Trinity College, where he obtained his doctoral degree in astrophysics from Cambridge University. Soon, to his utter surprise and delight, he was elected to the Prize Fellowship at Trinity College under the stewardship of J.J. Thompson. But the end of his three-year scholarship was soured by a difference of opinion with Arthur Eddington at a meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society here at Burlington House in London. This controversy was to influence the way Chandra worked for the rest of his career. At the January 1935 meeting, Chandra postulated his theory of the limiting mass of white dwarf star. It confirmed his earlier results obtained on that voyage to England by more rigorous and complete calculations. But no sooner had Chandra presented his paper than Eddington stood up and rejected the young man's results, not by any scientific argument, but by ridiculing the very combination of special relativity theory with quantum statistics. The whole episode was tantamount to a public humiliation for Chandra. I think that was Chandrasekhar's great contribution, relativistic degeneracy, which he introduced um, into astrophysics. And Eddington just could not bring himself around to accepting that idea. It turned out Chandrasekhar was right and Eddington was wrong. Eddington went on attacking him but Chandra did not do anything, so why did you do that? And then Chandra made the famous statement I quote. I saw, for, you know, I was young and I was 30 years of research and there was no, there was no reason harping on the same string that has happened, forget it and go on. He made that decision and that writing that book and working with another book, he got into this new pattern of his, you know, work on a particular area for a certain length of time write a number of papers and uh, write a monograph and go on to another field and so on. It became a, he became inward bound and not worry about whether it is recognized or not. The era of relativistic physics began with Albert Einstein who realized that space-time is not a stationary stage on which events play out as Isaac Newton had envisioned. Instead, space-time can bend, twist, and warp, very much like a trampoline reacting to a child jumping. Early on, Einstein realized that Newtonian mechanics was insufficient to reconcile the laws of classical mechanics with the laws of the electromagnetic field. This motivated him to develop his theory of relativity. Two years later, 
Einstein applied this theory to model the structure of the entire universe, which still holds good to this day. The cosmological constant. At the International Astronomical Union, Chandra noted that Newton not only postulated a universal law of gravitation, but also worked out all its consequences. The first equations describing planetary systems, satellites, and comets. Newton didn't just invent the law; he also believed deeply in his own theory. On the other hand, Einstein wrote down the fundamental field equations, but did not work out all their consequences. Ironically, he did not realize three major consequences of his own theory: the Big Bang, black holes, and gravitational waves. As Chandra pointed out, we now know that he was wrong to have not believed more strongly in his own theory. In 1937, after the Eddington controversy, Chandra decided to leave Cambridge. Back in Madras, he married Lalita Doreswami, a co-student at the Presidency College, and soon they were on their way to start a new life in America. Chandra took up a research position at the Yerkes Observatory in Williams Bay. About 70 kilometers from the main campus of the Chicago University, Otto Struve, the then director, was in the process of hiring some of the most brilliant young astronomers and astrophysicists from around the world, and Chandra was one of them. In 1897, the University of Chicago's astronomy and astrophysics program began with the construction. Of this observatory here in Wisconsin, thanks to a handsome endowment from Charles Yerkes, who had made his fortune with Chicago's electric railway. Interestingly, Yerkes Observatory prides itself as the birthplace of modern astrophysics. It is a fascinating example of the architecture and technological accomplishments of the late 19th century, built in a lavish style. It retains an old-world charm of its own even today, and this here is the very room that Chandra occupied for 27 years. Chandra was the first theoretician, in a modern sense, who was appointed to the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at least in the 1930s. In the United States, astronomy was.、Um, Really organized around observational program. The Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics was concentrated at the Yerkes Observatory. The 40-inch achromatic refracting telescope is fitted atop a high mount, and is the largest telescope ever to be used for research purposes. And the entire floor can be lifted. To raise astronomers to the eyepiece, and also adjust to the tilt of the telescope. The revolving dome has a circumference of over 60 feet. In addition, the observatory also houses a couple of reflecting telescopes. And is situated in a 70-acre woodland. And it is here that Chandra built his house overlooking the lake, which was to be his home for the next 28 years. In 1964, Chandra shifted base from Yerkes to the main Chicago campus, and started taking classes. At the Laboratory for Astrophysics and Space Research. From then till the very end, he continued to occupy the corner room at the end of the corridor, overlooking the Regenstein Library, which now houses the archive of his life's work: original manuscripts, books, and letters. After shifting to Chicago, Chandra turned his attention to a long-abandoned subject: 
the consequences of the limiting mass of white dwarfs. He devoted the next 30 years to a detailed investigation of black holes and singularities, covered in his book, The Mathematical Theory of Black Holes. But when Chandra really got into it and saw that in the 80s, he was able to analyze the structure of how the black holes react to external perturbations using you know, very beautiful and very sophisticated mathematics and basically derive the whole theory of what is called black hole perturbations. And that is what is this book is about. And it is a Bible for people who work in that area. Chandra's intellectual talents cut across the disciplines of physics, applied mathematics, astronomy and astrophysics. During a six-decade-long career, Chandra's research interests spanned an incredibly wide spectrum. Commenting on this, he once said, My work has followed a certain pattern motivated primarily by a quest after perspectives. He also said, I work on my own for my personal satisfaction, generally outside the scientific mainstream. Chandra's work invariably had a way of becoming mainstream a few years down the line. His highly cited review of Brownian motion started new fields of research even outside astronomy. His concept of dynamical friction appears almost as often in the literature as the Chandrasekhar limit. Apart from his long list of influential research papers, Chandra was also a prolific author. His masterly treatment of radiative transfer pioneered the invariant embedding technique, which later found applications in other fields as well. One good measure of Chandra's influence on our field is that over 100,000 copies of his highly technical books have been sold. And Newton's Principia, for the common reader, published just a couple of months before his death, was a result of his deep regard and admiration for a scientist whose work he believed to be both unsurpassed and unsurpassable. He has made many contributions to the subject. Characteristically, he puts all his research in a book after four or five years. But the contribution which he personally felt he was most happy with, not only within radiative transfer, but perhaps in his entire career, concerned a very specific problem, which had been unsolved from almost 1871. Uh, uh, that was the year in which uh, the blue of the sky was explained by the English physicist, uh, Lord Rayleigh. But that explanation was incomplete because it did not allow for one very important property of the radiation, which is uh, technically known as polarization. So he first formulated the right equations and they looked extremely complicated. And a lesser person would have just gone to a computer. But what he did, and there he acknowledges uh, taking a vital idea from a Russian astrophysicist called Ambert Sumian, what he did was to come up with uh, something that surprised the whole community. These very complicated looking equations, after he made various transformations on them, actually produced an exact solution. But he didn't stop there. He compared it with the experimental data which had been taken on the properties of the sky and the comparison is there in his book. So this was the kind of uh, crowning glory of his work. And in the overall field of radiative transfer, any new person entering the field would be first asked to read his book to, because the basic principles have not changed. What has changed is that uh, we now have much more powerful computers and uh, we have much more detailed knowledge of the atomic physics, but uh, his work still remains a landmark. Isaac Newton's Principia, published in 1687, is one of the most important scientific books ever written laying the groundwork for all of classical mechanics. Newton described universal gravitation and three laws of dynamics, which dominated our view of the universe for the next two centuries. In mathematics, Newton is credited with the invention of calculus and was the first to apply it to physics. Newton showed that the motion of objects on Earth and of celestial bodies were governed by the same natural laws of motion. 
by demonstrating consistency between Kepler's laws of planetary motion and his own theory of gravitation, Newton successfully eliminated all remaining doubts about heliocentrism. Gravitation is, of course, extremely important. And uh, for most problems in astrophysics up to the 1960s, Newtonian gravity was sufficient. And indeed, uh, Chandra himself, along with uh, one of his students, wrote a book called Ellipsoidal Figures of Equilibrium, how a fluid mass which rotates can deform in shape under the joint influence of rotation and gravity. So he was a master of Newtonian gravity, there is no doubt about that. I think in the Chandrasekhar's style of working, he said the first word in the field of white dwarf limiting mass and that was his really seminal contribution for which he earned the Nobel Prize. Well, good many decades after he had done the work, uh, he got it in 1983. Chandra's prolific contribution to diverse areas of science made him a winner of all the coveted honors, medals and prizes. The Indian National Science Academy crowned him with the Srinivas Ramanujan Medal and the Venu Bapu Memorial Award. The Government of India took pride in bestowing on him the Padma Vibhushan. The Indian Institute of Astrophysics established the Himalayan Chandra Telescope at Handley in Ladakh. It comprises of a two-meter telescope equipped with a faint object spectrograph camera with optical and infrared images. It is operated remotely from a center at Hoskote near Bengaluru via a dedicated satellite link. Its data archive has helped many an Indian and foreign astronomer and astrophysicist. I was involved with the setting up of Ayuka. We were at the time looking for somebody who was great enough and was an astrophysicist and was somebody who was completely unique. And there was no better person suited uh, to that description than Chandra. And he inaugurated uh, our Ayuka by setting the Foucault pendulum here in motion. Galileo's invention of the simple telescope spurred the development of astronomy into an exciting discipline of science. And in the middle of the last century, propelled us into the space age. Since then, man has made a mark on the very craters of the moon, first observed using that refracting telescope in 1609. In most fields, researchers would be thrilled to have just one direct glimpse of the past. Cosmology, the study of the origin and evolution of the universe, is such a field where one may witness history. The beams of starlight we see carry photons that have been streaming towards us for many thousands of years. Thus, we are actually staring at signals of an ancient past. The original Galilean telescope gathered about 55 times more light than the unaided eye. Over the last 400 years, Galileo's simple telescope has become highly sophisticated, a billion times more sensitive than the naked eye. It would be no exaggeration to say that a comparable rate of sophistication has been achieved in just the past few decades with the advent of the modern-day satellite telescopes. Chandra is the, the premier X-ray astronomy observatory for the NASA. Um, and it was launched about uh, 11 years ago, in 1999. Chandra was named after a Nobel Prize physicist, Subramanian Chandra Shekhar. It's very apt naming of the satellite because Chandrasekhar had many contributions to astrophysics. But one of the, the reasons why people remember him more is because of his work on the end products of stellar evolution. White dwarfs, neutron stars, black holes. And these are exactly the sources of X-rays that we see with the Chandra satellite. And what we see in X-rays, therefore, are things that are very, very hot. Chandra has given us beautiful information on the lifetime of a star, a star sometimes explodes. It's what we call a supernova. The NASA Chandra X-ray Observatory serves as a metaphor for his continuing legacy. Detecting X-ray sources that are billions of light years away. 
unraveling the deepest and darkest secrets of our universe. In Chandra's birth centenary year, three important meetings took place. One in Chicago, which was his work, working place most of his life. The second in Bangalore and the third in Chennai. These meetings reflect the high regard in which he was placed internationally, how he was considered an important figure in different branches of astrophysics. Because these meetings brought together under one roof people working in different areas who would not normally be seen under the same roof, but who shared the common interest that they were inspired by Chandra's work in their respective subjects. sensitivity to mathematical equations, so he could feel his way through complicated things which the mere complication would have daunted anybody else, and he could feel his way through, largely through this aesthetic sense that he had in this area. That was uh, certainly the day that I realized uh, he was not an austere uh, authoritarian figure, he was really a very caring person. Today, astrophysics is regarded as one of the landmarks in our understanding of the cosmos, where the rules of quantum mechanics merge or interact with the rules of laws of gravity and all other forces which act on at greater distances. So one could say that this was the legacy which Chandrasekhar left and which is being cherished by people who work in astrophysics today. Astronomy is the only science for which we have a continuous record from ancient times to the present. It appears to have justified the curiosity that man has felt about the origin of the universe. Man contemplation of the astronomical universe has provided us with the one continuous thread that connects us with antiquity. <laughs> <laughs> 